Seches Yoma Daf Chafalov discusses the miracles that happened in the Beis Hamikdash. Begins with a comment about one of them, then it lists the ten that happened. Whereas questions are on the list, there seem to be too many, then there seem to be too few. How exactly we work out that there's exactly ten, and then the Gemara will discuss some of the other things that happened in the Beis Hamikdash: the smoke of the mizbeach and the fire on the mizbeach, what it looked like and whether it moved, and a number of other miracles that happened. So the Gemara begins in a quote of Yehuda who said that when Kaiso were in the Azara, the Beis Hamikdash. So when they stood together during tefillah, they were squashed together so so tightly uh, packed in that they couldn't even bend or lean. They were squashed. Uh, they were fully straight. As a matter of fact, some of them even had their feet off the floor. But well, then when it came time to bow down, lie down, and say vidoy, they had a space of four amas between them, at least, so that nobody would hear vidoy being said by anyone else. This was a miracle that happened. Then the Rav Yehuda continues and it says that when it was squeezed and it was packed together, actually there was an overflow crowd out of the um, Hechel, out of the Azara, into the space around it on all sides. It's, it was out of the Azara, fill, it, it was out of the Hechel, filling the entire space around it on all sides. There was a space of 11 Amos around the building of the Hechel and it squeezed into that entire area over there. So the Gemara now says that there were ten miracles. We've seen there's a mission in Perkyavis that says there are ten miracles that happened in the Basin Mikdash, and this is one of them. So let's hear the list of the ten and have some kashas on it. So the ten are as follows. First of all, no woman ever miscarried from the smell of the meat of the Karpanos. Women, when they have a very strong desire for certain foods, that can cause them to miscarry, but the uh, smell, although it was very good, and the women may have desired it, but they couldn't. They weren't allowed to eat it and never caused a miscarriage. Also, none of the Karbanos meat ever spoiled. There was never a fly in any of the uh, many meats and carbonos and all kinds of things that were happening in the area that served almost like a slaughterhouse. There was never an incident in which a Kohen Agado was disqualified in Yom Kippur because he saw a carry, because he had a seminal emission. There was never any psal, not in the carbon oimer, in the carbon shtei alechem, and the lechem hapanim. These were three flower-based carbonos, could have had a problem with them, and they wouldn't be able to be replaced. Carbon oimer had to be cut the night of Matzoi, the first day of Pesach and brought the next morning, it wouldn't be able to be replaced if there was a problem. Shtei Alechem and Lechem Apanim had to be made on Erev Shabbos and Erev Shavuos. And um, if there was a problem with them, you wouldn't be able to bake them on Shavuos or on Shabbos, and uh, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be re- replaceable, but there was never a problem that happened with them. Next miracle is Lemnit Tzufim Shachem Revachem, as we said, that they had mar- they miraculously had more space when it came time to b- to bow down. Also, there was never an incident in which a snake or a scorpion bit anybody in Yerushalayim, and there was never an incident in which somebody said, I don't have place in Yerushalayim, I don't have place to eat, I don't have place to sleep. There was always enough room for everybody in Yerushalayim, although it was a relatively small city, and the entire college was all packed in there, there was miraculous room for everybody. So, Umar says, you told me that there were ten miracles in the Mesa Migdash. These last two are in Yerushalayim, not the Mesa Migdash. So, Umar says, okay, take them off the list, instead we'll put... Two other miracles that there were. The rain never put out the fire on the Mizbeach, and the smoke in the Mizbeach was never blown off the line by the winds, no matter, even if all the winds in the world blew at once, the smoke still rose in a straight column. So when it says, okay, you have ten miracles, but the problem is there, there are other ones that should be on the list, and it should be more than a ten. Is there a Bryce that says, quotes Rabbi Shmaya of Kalnabo, who says that the broken shards of Kalim, which the Kohanim used to use to cook, and eat the carbonos meat, those kalim absorbed carbon flavor. And when the carbon became nicer, when it was left over past the time that you were allowed to eat it within, those meats became usser, it was cars to eat them, and those those kalim, the bowls and plates, also became usser because they had that forbidden flavor in it. So they had to break them. They broke them and they were swallowed into the ground immediately in the place in which they broke. Otherwise, the entire base of would have become a, traf, a trash heap of broken uh, plates. And then there was another thing that Abayi says that the intestines of birds that were removed in the carbon ola sa'of and the uh, feathers, all these things were put in the place of the Dishon Hamizbech. They were put in the um, place in which the ashes were put on the side of the ramp. So they put these things there also. Also, they took the uh, burnt ashes from the inner. Mizbeach, the Mizbeach HaKitoras, and also they took some of the burnt parts out of the Menorah, they put all these things in the place of the Dishai next to the Mizbeach, next to the ramp. 
just to the east of the ramp, and they were all swallowed in the spot exactly over there. So Gemara says you have this, so these extra things, and these should go on the list as well. So Gemara says you're right. We're gonna have to take two off the list. How do we take two off the list? Simple. We had three psulim that didn't happen. So condense them into one. That's one thing. All that, that all these three psulim didn't happen. So you condense three into one. Now you have two more spots. So put in these two things. If you're condensing all the psulim into one, then you should condense all the things that were swallowed into one. If you condense all the things that were swallowed into one, then you just have one extra thing. And you so you took off two, and we're only getting back one. So you're missing one. Now you only have nine. So it's okay. There are other things. There are other things. Not a problem. Um. Uh, there's Rabbi Shua ben Levi, who said there was a nace that happened at the Lechem upon him, although it was in the Shulchan for a week. And a week later, when it was time to take it off, it was still hot and fresh, just like the day it was baked, like it was fresh out of the oven. So says, okay, great, now you have ten, but there's still more things that should be on the list. Why aren't the following things on the list? Rabbi Levi says, we have a Masar, we know that the Aaron didn't take up any space. There was ten Amas space on all four sides of the Aran, and we know that there was only 20 Amas by 20 Amas in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Obviously, the Aran itself was in the center, but it didn't take up any space, and that's why we had 10 Amas in each direction. Also, the Kruvim, the Kruvim, there were two Kruvim, made by Shalom and each one had a wingspan of 5 Amas, and they were put together, wingtip to wingtip, that should take up all 20 Amas of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, but where were their bodies? No space for the bodies of the Kruvim to stand. So obviously, uh, there was a miracle there that they, they, they fit in there. So these are two miracles. Why don't you list them? So Gemara says, these are miracles that happened with inside the Heichol, within the Lechem Apanim, within the Heichol, uh, not the Lechem Apanim, it, would, it was with the Aron and the Kruvim that was inside the Heichol. People didn't see that. We're only talking about miracles that were visible for everybody to see. So Gemara says, well, uh, you're talking about miracles that were visible for everyone to see, you should take the Lechem HaPanam off the list. Because the Lechem HaPanam was inside the Heichel. People didn't see that. So how did they know that it was hot and fresh? So the Gemara says, no, the Lechem HaPanam was actually brought out for the people to sh- to be shown and see that it was hot and fresh. And I'll prove it to you. Because we have a Pasuk that says, Ala Shulchan HaTahar. The Shulchan has to be Tahar. That implies that the Shulchan could potentially become Tameh. It just has to be Tahar. And it means something that it is Mechabal Tumah. The problem is, is that it's made out of wood. The layer on top of gold doesn't count. It's bottled to the wood. And the halach is, is that any wooden kli is only Mechabal Tumah if it's movable. There's a heckish between wood and sackcloth. And just like sackcloth is only Mechabal Tumah if it's movable. Um, the Shulchan is only a couple of it's movable. So it's got to be that it was moved, and the Shulchan was moved out to show people and say, look how, look at this nace that happened, it happens all the time. Okay, so the Gemara now says there's another, another miracle that happened. Quotes of Oishio says, when Shem Melech built the base Hamikdash, he planted a tree of gold, and the tree grew special, delicious fruits. Perhaps the fruits themselves were also made f- f- from gold. And then it says that when the winds would blow, the fruits would fall, they would knock into each other and make a loud noise, and then they would fall off the tree, like the Pasuk says. A Pasuk Gemara quotes in a Tehillim that says, Yirash Kalvanon Pirio, that it will make noise, like Levanon, when its fruits, the fruits will make a sound, it will knock into each other when the wind blows. Um... Now it says further that when the Goyim came in to conquer the base of Migdash, the fruits instantly dried up, like the Pasuk says um, in Nachum, Uperach Levonon Umlo. The uh, flowers, the buds of Levonon, that's the tree we're referring to, become wasted away. In the future, Kajabarach was going to return them, like the Pasuk says in Yeshaya, Parach Tifrach Vatogel Av Gilas Viranin Kavod Halavonon. So, therefore, you see, again, Levonin will come back, and it'll be great, and this tree will be restored. So, why don't you list this miracle? So, Gemara says, this miracle we're not going to count, because this miracle is just something that stood there, not something that happened. It was just there. It was a miraculous tree, but it didn't do anything. Not something that was continually uh, happening, and we're only talking about something that happened, not one that stood. So, Gemara says, well, once you say that, then you don't have to worry about the Kasha we asked earlier, about the Kapor, about the Kruvim, and the Aron not taking up space in the Kodesh Kedoshim, because they were also Nisim that just stood. They weren't things which were actively happening.
Okay, that completes our discussion of the list. The Gemara now has a bone to pick with one of the items on the list. You said that the smoke of the fire of the Mizbeach never was blown by the wind. The Gemara says there was smoke from the fire of the Mizbeach. There was no smoke from the fire of the Mizbeach. The Gemara quotes a Baiza that says that there were three things, there were five things that it says about the fire on the Marach, on the Mizbeach. First of all, there was a giant coal there that appeared to be in the shape of a crouching lion. Second, it was as bright as the sun, the fire. Third, it had a feel to it. It was thickness to it. It wasn't just, like, energy. Next thing it says is that it was able to burn both wet and dry things. And the, and the final thing is that it did not give off any smoke. So there was no smoke. So what are you talking about, smoke? So Gemara says there were two fires on the Mizbeach. There was a fire that came down from Shemayim. That didn't give off smoke. And then there was a fire that people brought. And people were supposed to bring a fire like we see in Ebraisa. It says in the Pasuk, V'nasu b'nei Aaron HaKayin Eish Lam Mizbeach, that the Kohanim put fire on the Mizbeach. Even though the fire comes down from Shemayim, people are supposed to bring their own fire. And that's the one that did give off smoke, and that's the smoke we were referring to when we said it didn't get blown by the wind. Now Gemara says, hold on a second. You said just before that it w- there was a cold there that appeared crouching like a lion. Um, we have a Bryce of Rechanin, Eskana Kahanim, says it was crouching like a dog, and he says he saw it. Where says not a contradiction, he was in Bayes Cheney, second base of Migdash was crouching like a dog. First base of Migdash was crouching like a lion. Where says, eh, I'm sorry, but second base of Migdash, there was no fire. There was no fire of uh, of Hashem that came down from Shemayim on the Marocha. And we know that because we learn from a Pasuk in Chagai, discussing the second base of Migdash. And he says, Ve'erzebai V'yikavda, and the Kavda is spelled, it has a Kri in Iksiv. The Kri is a Kavda with a He at the end, but it's spelled Ekavad without a He at the end. There's a missing He. So why is it missing He? Because there were five missing things in the second base of English. He is a numerical value of five. There were five missing things. What are the five things? Um, so there was no Arun, Kapiras, and Kruvim. That's one. That all counts as one. There was no Kodesh Kedashim and any of its aspects. The next thing is that there was no fire. There was no Shechina, the Shechina didn't arrest him, there was no Ruach HaKadosh, and there was no Urim V'tumim in the Kohen Gadol's breastplate. So you see, there was no fire. So where it says, that, no, there was a fire, it just didn't burn anything, it didn't help. But there was definitely a fire, and it could have been in the shape of a dog, and in fact, it was. It says the Gemara, an interesting Bryce about fires. There are six types of fire in the world, the Gemara says. There is one fire which eats, meaning it burns solid, dry things, but it doesn't drink. It does not... Um, burn water. It says Zimar, that's referring to our standard normal fire. It burns dry things and it doesn't burn water. It gets put out by water. Then there's a type of fire which drinks, but it doesn't eat. It says Zimar, that refers to a fever. When a sick person has a fever, he's very thirsty. The, f- the fever is like a fire and it dries out all his liquid, but he has no interest in eating. Next type of fire that there is, is a fire which both eats and drinks. That was the fire of Elio Hanavi when he um, brought the carbon on her caramel, he had poured water all over the place there, and the fire actually burned the cow that he put on the mizbech, and it also burned the water that was there. Then, next, the Gemara says there's one that burns both wet and dry things together, that's the fire on the mizbech. Fifth, the Gemara says there's a fire that pushes away all the fire, that's the fire in which Hanani, Mishael, and Azari were thrown when Nebuchadnezzar was angry at them. He threw them into a fire, and Gabriel came, and he cooled them off. Their fire, they, there was no fire on them. They were cooled. But the fire went, and it burned the people who threw him in. So he, he, he was a Malach, Gabriel. A Malach is considered to be fire. And he came, and he pushed away the fire from them, and onto those people that threw them into the fire. And then the last fire is a fire which actually consumes another fire. A fire burns a fire. That refers to none other... Then the fire of a Baruch Hu himself, and and that uh, we'll see in a Gemara in Sanhedrin that says that when he spoke to the Malachim about creating people, and one there were two groups that said Ma'anoshkis is Kirena, why should he create humans? And he stuck his finger between them Kaviachal and burned them. So that is the fire which burns the fire Malachim or fire, and this was a fire, and he burned that uh, fire up. Okay, says the Gemara further, the smoke on the Mizbeach, even the all the winds in the world would blow, it wouldn't move. It says the Gemara, is that true? We have a statement of Yitzchak Baravdimi that seems to indicate that the smoke of the Mizbeach did blow. And the smoke says that the uh, statement is that on Matzah Yamtev of Sukkis, everybody would stand and watch the smoke of the Mizbeach. And it wouldn't be a simon how the winds were going to blow throughout the year. This was right after Yom Tov, right after Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, Sukkot, Yom Neroim. 
and this was a sign as to how the winds were going to blow this year. And everybody saw and had their each had their different reactions. So let's see what happens. If the wind blew northward, that means the wind was coming from the south. It means it would be a moist, warm breeze, and all the fruits would become ripe quickly and rot, and people would not be able to store them for a long time. Who was happy about that? The poor people. That means that fruits would, would be cheap, the market would be flooded with fruit, and it wouldn't be able to be stored for a long time, and therefore it would be available, people would be throwing it out, they wouldn't have to worry about high prices. However, if it, the people that were upset were the farmers, the people who own houses and who own farms and businesses and stores, they wanted to be able to store the fruit for long term and charge high prices for them by holding on to them. They wouldn't be able to do that, so they were sad. Now, it was going to be a rainy year that year. However, if the wind was, if the column of smoke bent to the south, that means that the wind was coming out of the north, that's a dry, um, astringent wind, then they would be able to store it for a long time. So the Baal were happy, and the poor people were sad because the prices of fruit were going to be high this year. Now, what happened if it blew to the east or to the west? So the uh, Brysa says, that if it um, blew, if if the column bent to the east, means the wind was c- coming out of the west, everybody was happy, because that's a nice even wind that didn't make it too dry, didn't make it too wet, didn't make them spoil too fast, too slow. That was a fair, equitable decision for everybody. If, however, it was blowing towards the west, that means it was coming out of the east. That's a terrible, very drying wind. And that's gonna. Then everybody was upset because it wasn't gonna be enough food for anybody. So here you clearly see that the wind was blown by the smoke. So the Gemara says, yeah, it blew gently so that it bent like a tree blowing in the wind, but it didn't scatter. That's the point. The smoke column didn't scatter at any point. Okay. Now the Gemara discusses. Hold on a second. You just told me that wind blowing out of the west is good and blowing out of the east is bad. I have a price that says differently. Bryce says um, that a wind from the east is good, and a wind from the bad, a wind from the west is bad. Uh, the Bryce continues, and it says wind from the north is good for wheat um, when it's grown a third, and it's bad for olives at the time of blossoming. A wind from the south is bad for the wheat that have grown a third, and it's good for the olives at the time of blossoming. The way to remember that is that the shulchan, which was made out of wheat, it, the bread on it is made out of wheat, is in the north. And therefore, northern wind is good for wheat. And the menorah, that's used olive oil, so that was in the south, and a southern wind is therefore good for olives. That's how you can remember that. So Gemara says, um, so you have a steer here. Is west wind good or east wind good? So Gemara says, depends where you are. The wind blowing from the west is nice and provides adequate moisture. If you're in Eretz Yisrael, that's good. If you're in Bava, which is a very wet, rainy land, it's no good. Everything's going to rot. If, you, however, you, the wind is blowing from the east, that'll dry things out. And then if you're in Bavel, that's good because you want it to dry out so you can store things. And if you're near to show, that's bad. And this concludes the first parak of Masechus Yomah.